Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland Devo 30. I'm Pastor Ruben. Thank you for joining us today. We stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays. And if you're in the neighborhood, love to have you here at 5383 Martin Street in Harupa Valley. If you're not attending a church at this moment and you'd like to check us out, please do so. Love to meet you. Good morning, Diana. Uh, today we are in the book of Ephesians and we will be looking at chapter 2. Let's go ahead and pray. Gracious Father, we come before you, Lord, <coughs> in the name of Jesus, Lord. We ask for your Holy Spirit, Lord, to lead us and guide us in your word, Lord. Bring out, Father, your truth to us, Lord, and help us to understand it. But Lord, most importantly, Lord, and this is the most difficult part of our Christian walk, is to apply it to our lives, Lord even if we don't feel like it, Lord, even if it's grudgingly, Lord, I believe that God will honor the obedience more than anything else, Lord. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we're in chapter two, and I thought it would be interesting to, to look, at, uh, look at our lives in the mirror of this chapter, uh, where we came from, to where we should be at today. Uh, the Bible tells us that you must be born again in order to enter the kingdom of God in, in John chapter three. Um, very clearly, if you're gonna enter the kingdom of God, you've got to be born again. You gotta be a new creature in Christ Jesus, Paul says. Uh, it's a circumcision of the heart where the heart changes its attitude and its desires. And Paul does a great job here at comparing the old man with the new man. And so we're gonna look at the old person and then we're gonna look at the new person. And so in light of that, keep in mind, uh, keep in mind your own walk, what you were before and what you are now. Now the hardest part of our walk, as I prayed, uh, is definitely the application. It is interesting that you can sit through a message and nod your head like amen, amen, <laughs> amen, and then immediately be challenged from that message, whatever the message was, whatever the, the observation, the interpretation, and the application part, be challenged with the application and then you fail. And usually that's where we start having our, our doubts. Am I really a Christian? <laughs> Am I really you know, able to do this Christianity? Am I able to walk the walk and talk the talk? You know? and, and you realize that you can't. And so, it's it's really a daily, carefully looking at every step that we take and then making the right choices. And so I want you to notice that as we uh, read through this. So let's look at this, this old person, what we were and how we're gonna come from there to something new in verses one through three. Paul says, and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. So first, First thing, he says very clearly that in the past you were dead, and you were dead in trespasses and sins. You missed the mark. Uh, you could not follow the law. You could not keep the commandments of God. Thus, you needed to become alive, as he says in the beginning there. And then he goes on in verse 2, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit of who now works in the sons of disobedience. So at one point in your life, you literally walked according to the course of this world. You were just like the world. You could not be uh, set apart by anyone because you looked like everyone else. Uh, you dressed alike, you thought alike, you lived alike, you partied alike, uh, your political views were alike, you know, um, maybe not so much whether it's one or the other, um, but let's just look at some of the things that are going on in our world today. <clears throat> this push for, for us to receive uh, pedophilers as normal. That's gonna be a push and it's gonna be pushed even more and more as we see the day. I just saw another posting on it, an article, how uh, famous people are now coming out and they're, they're stating that they're pedophilers. They just had a, a parade and they had a young boy with men and they were dressed in their drag thing and, and it was just like, wow. So this is gonna be pushed even more. If you were a part of that world, you would say, I accept this. 
There's nothing wrong with this. They were born this way. That's what the world would do. Paul says, you were once like that. You walked according to the air of the powers of this world, and that's uh, Satan himself. And these were all disobedient to God. Then he says in verse 3, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as others. So this is what we were. We walked after the lust of our flesh. Now, the lust of our flesh basically means whatever we desired, whatever it was we desired. It doesn't necessarily have to be sexual. It can be anything. If you desire this or you desire that, that's lusting after the things of your heart. We once walked that way. We once desired those things. We were, by nature, the children of wrath, just as the rest of the world. That's where we came from. Now, if you're still in there, then you need to be born again. You need to receive Jesus Christ into your heart. You need to change and allow God to change you, surrender your life to him. Because this is what you should be. Let's look at verses 4 through 10 here and see what we should be now. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. How? By grace you have been saved. So, the first thing of being born again is you've been made alive. Made alive from what? From death. So, at one point you were death, you lived like the world, but now you are made alive to the spiritual realm. You become a new creature in Christ Jesus. The old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. So, you have been made alive. And in, a, in, a, in a other words, you kind of put on your spiritual lens... And you see things differently now, and you can see the disasters of sin itself. Then this is done by grace. It's not your work. Now, Paul says that in verse 8, which we'll get to. Uh, but it's done by grace, but it's through our faith in God. And he goes on in verse 5, Even when you were dead in trespasses, made alive together with Christ, by grace you've been saved, and raised up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So our place now is no longer in the world and a part of the world and sitting with the world. Psalms chapter one, right? Uh, they sit with those that are scornful, but we sit with the righteous now. We sit on the throne of God. We sit in the heavenly places. And that's what God does for us. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceedingly riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Jesus Christ. For by grace, and this is how we're saved, for by grace you've been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. So Paul is now qualifying what he's saying here. This is what you were, this is what you become, and this is what you become through grace in Jesus Christ, through faith. Then he says this in verse 10, which is interesting. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So God has created works for us to walk in. Now, those works are not necessarily only in church, though that's a start. There are works to be done in church, children's ministry, greeters, worship leaders, ushers, various things like that. It's definitely works that have to be done. But there's also works in our daily life. When we wake up, there's a work of prayer, a work of reading the scriptures. There's a work of walking with God. There's a work of being kind, of gentleness, kindness, uh, not being rude. Uh, Corinthians 13 lists all what love is. Those are all works. And God has prepared those works for us that we should walk in them. Now, it's interesting because uh, when we are living in a day and we encounter an opportunity to do good. And you know what I mean. There, there could be maybe a homeless man or, or, or somebody that just has a need. And you stop and you think, do I help them or do I not help them? And, and we almost have to pray about it. You know, when the reality is, is God has put that good work before you. And maybe you ought to just walk into it. You know, I, I mentioned on Sunday that we went to the conference and I had three extra tickets uh, because guys didn't three guys didn't show up to the conference. And so I was walking outside and I was thinking, um, I have these three tickets and I'm waiting to see if maybe one of our guys from church would, would come down to the conference um, 
and I was kind of looking outside in front, and all of a sudden the Lord just showed me guys waiting in line to purchase tickets. And there was just three guys right there, and immediately I thought, maybe I ought to give them to them. And then I thought, well, maybe not. <laughs> yeah. But then I thought, why not? They're in my pocket, and I'm ready to go in, and they're not being used. Why not bless them? So I walked over there, and I said, hey, guys, you waiting in line to get your tickets? I go, yeah, yeah, yeah. I go, here, Lord bless you guys. He's blessing you right now. And I gave them tickets, and they're like, oh, wow, dude, thanks, man. And he turns to you, like, look what I got, guys. Look, this is, wow, God is good, you know? And so an opportunity to bless them. So God <clears throat> has created the good works for us to, to walk in them. You could be in school, and maybe your, your friend is having a hard time studying uh, mathematics, English, whatever it is, and you all of a sudden see, maybe I can help him. That's a good work, and you should walk in it. So that's the difference compared to the world, right? The world is, that's none of my business. They'll take care of it. Someone else will help. You know, that's the world today. And so that's the difference of being born again. And then he goes on, in verse 11, and we see, again, him going through this this picture of what we were and what we have become. So let's look at verses 11 to 12 uh, and what we were in the past. He says, Therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcised by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ. So first point, before you were born again, before you were a Christian, you are literally without Christ. That brings up an interesting question because there is this belief in universalism. I don't know if you know what universalism is, but that is that everyone gets to go to heaven. You know, so you ask somebody on the streets, you believe in God? Yeah, I believe in God. Does that mean they're going to heaven? That's the question. Uh, you get around people, let's say, in a funeral, and they're not Christians, but they're at a funeral, and you're talking about the person that has passed away, and maybe afterwards you go up and says, you think that he'll be in heaven? And of course he'll be in heaven, and I'll see him later. Will they be in heaven? That's the question. You know, if, if universalism is true, then it doesn't matter what you do in life. You all just get to go to heaven. That means, and logically, we have to think logically here, and the log logical conclusion is Hitler's in heaven. So is Stalin. You know, these guys that have created, at uh, what's the word, atrocities in the world, they get to go to heaven because ultimately all mankind goes to heaven. But that's not true. So Paul says here, you're without Christ. And if you're without Christ, then what? You're without heaven. Because those without Christ are unbelievers. And Christ said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. And if you want to get to the Father, you got to come through me. It's only through Jesus Christ. So if you're without Christ, that's our old life, without Christ. So he says that you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of the promise, having no hope and without God in the world. No hope. What does that mean? No hope of heaven. And, and even the promises that God gave Israel and to Abraham. Uh, and part of the promise there was there would be seeds from the Gentile world. So that means you would have no hope. So before Christ, your life was hopeless. And so you just lived out a mundane life like the rest of the world. But now we went from that to this. Look at 13 through 22. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been made near by the blood of Jesus Christ. I love that. Been made near to who? To heaven, to the angels, to God, to God, yeah, but to Jesus, we've been made near. You can actually walk with Jesus. You can actually converse with Jesus. You can actually have a relationship with God now, Amen. a personal relationship with God. You were once far off, but now you have been reconciled by the blood of Jesus. For he himself is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of division between us. Speaking of the veil in the temple, 18 inches, they say, a veil was ripped from top to bottom when Jesus was crucified. God broke that veil down and said, now you can enter the Holy of Holies by the blood of Jesus Christ. What a glorious thing. What a hopeful thing that we can come to God now in that manner. 
having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. Now, what is he talking about? Well, earlier he was talking about Israel and how the promises of Israel and how the Gentiles now are a part of that. So God himself has brought peace between us Gentile and Jews, and given us both an inheritance together. This is the work of God alone. Has done that in our lives. That is glorious that we can come to God in that manner and in that way, and we become one with each other. Verse 17, And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near. Again, Gentiles and Jews. The ones that were near were the Jews. The ones that were far off are Gentiles. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. That's another great thing. You came from not having any connection to Christ. You're without Christ. To now you have a connection to Christ. You draw near to Christ. But also you have the Spirit of God in you. That dwells in you. And the Spirit of God is the power of God that gives us the strength and the ability to walk the Christian walk, to have the character that God desires us to have. He sealed us until the day of redemption. He is our comforter, he is our leader, he guides us and leads us, he gives us gifts. It's all his work in our lives. This is the Holy Spirit working in us. Not that we should pray to the Holy Spirit, but we should pray to Jesus that he allows the Holy Spirit to rule in our lives and that we would not quench the Holy Spirit as he desires to rule. Now, therefore, verse 19, and we'll close uh, here with these few verses. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. So we're not strangers like before. We're now citizens of the kingdom of God. Now, think of it in this terms. We are all citizens of the United States, right? We're strangers to Europe. We're strangers to uh, those countries in that area, India, that I've been to, Africa, where I've been to, uh, Israel, we're strangers. Uh, we're not citizens there. In fact, while we're there, we are still strangers there. But can you imagine if we got there and we could get a dual citizenship? If all of a sudden we can get there and we can apply and we can become a citizen of Israel, and that's what has happened. We're citizens of the world in that we live in the world, but now we're also citizens of God's kingdom because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And so we are citizens there, and we're also sons and daughters of the Savior Jesus Christ of his household. Verse 20 says, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built to gather for a habitation of God in the spirit. So expounding on this idea of being a part of the household of God that Jesus is that foundation, right? He is the cornerstone of the foundation of God. Um, the law isn't the foundation by which we stand on. It is Jesus that we stand on alone. He is the rock. You remember he told Peter that you'll be a rock, a pebble, but on this rock, the gates of Hades will not prevail. And he was speaking of himself being the rock. And that rock speaks of a solid, firm foundation that's unmovable. You can't shake it no matter what. No matter what you do, no matter what anyone does, that foundation is there. There's an attack on Christianity today, and it's going to continue to, to grow and grow as, as we draw closer to the end. And we're seeing it already in, in our country. In, in uh, Canada, I was just reading <clears throat> that in Canada you cannot... Uh, you cannot preach hate, hate messages, so you can't preach Romans chapter 1. <clears throat> they will take away your license and, and your church there. And we're starting to see that here, like in Muslim states, uh, what is it, uh, Chicago, I think it is, it's very Muslim, one of those? Michigan. Michigan, Chicago, I'm sorry. Very... There, it's now illegal to, to preach like that. So our rights are being taken away uh, slowly uh, in, in that manner. As you know, um, 
about the woman who was a veteran, her husband was a veteran, and the VA tried to kick her out of the home because she was having a Bible study, which she had for years and years and years. And now they're saying you're an offense to some people, so we, can, we want you out. You know, of course, we, Pacific Justice Institute came to her rescue and was able to reinstate her. But things like this are happening all the time, and there's just this attack. But even though there's an attack by the world <clears throat> upon Christianity, the foundation is still set. You can't move it. Christ is that foundation, and Christ will always be solid. Even if the church shakes a little bit, it's not going to be torn apart. In fact, the church actually grows in persecution. So it could be that this persecution is coming upon the church because look at where we're at, guys. <clears throat> the church is so confused right now. It's so watered down. No one's teaching the truth anymore. They're not going from book to book, chapter to chapter, verse by verse anymore. They're just doing topical messages. <clears throat> and it's sad. <clears throat> uh, it's sad when, when you get questions like, where was God in the beginning? You know, and it's like, what? what, mm. what uh, where, are you going to church? Because you should know this. It's simple stuff. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. John 1, very clear. God has always existed outside of us, you know. And so people are not being taught the Word. They're just being taught topics <clears throat> of life. Not only are they not being taught the Word, they're not being taught through power. They're taught, they're taught to divide themselves among groups, you know, like the Corinthians, you know, I'm of this group and I'm of that group, you know, and, and we're separate and arguing and divided among each other, just like the children of Israel when they begin to divide themselves and spread themselves apart into different, different tribes and then they became weak and God had to go in there and what? Bring Babylon to bring them into captivity to strengthen them up again. And then later on, what, 70 years, they returned. And at that point, they began to rebuild the temple and so forth. So I think that the church is in the place right now where it's very weak, it's watered down. Does that mean all the church? No. There's churches that are thriving. Of course there are. Of course there are. God's Spirit is working in different places for whatever reasons. But when you look at the church in general, it's very weak. It's very weak <clears throat> because of our carnality. Um, instead of being more biblical than anything else. Uh, we're not conservative, we're not liberal. You know, I know sometimes we take those titles, well, I'm a conservative Christian. No, you're a biblical Christian, guys. You're supposed to be a biblical Christian, not a conservative or not a liberal Christian. Are you biblical? And, and being biblical is radical <laughs> when you think about it because the Bible is radical. Like we saw on, on Sunday, right? You know, when you have disputes among your brother, what you're supposed to do and what Christ did on the cross, it just it blows you away. And people understood that. They were weeping at the end of the service because the reality is, is that Christ is our example. And if he took the hurt and the blame, then we should also take the hurt and the blame. But that's so difficult to do. And we know that it's difficult to do, but that's the weakness of the church. There's going to come a time when God will will separate the, the shaft from the wheat, from the sheep, from the goat, and the church will be strong again. And we're waiting for that day. But he's building. He's the foundation. He's the cornerstone. And he's building us up. How does he build us up? Through trials, through struggles. It's the only way to build us up. But he doesn't build us up through things going easy. Now, we like that, right? We like life to be easy, you know, and not difficult. Um, that's how you grow. I remember... Years ago, I'm talking years ago, when I was in high school, I think I was in 10th grade and a neighbor came to me. Actually, the, my neighbor's a friend of mine, his mother came to me and said, Ruben, I want you to talk to my son. He's going to go to 9th grade next year. And he is scared. He doesn't know what to expect. And he is really scared. He doesn't want to go and he's crying. And, you know, so I went over there to tell him that it's not a big deal, but it's a scary thing. I asked my granddaughter that last night. How was it? getting into ninth grade she goes it was easy I'm like but did you were you fearful not really but it was kind of interesting because I didn't see the people that I saw in junior high you remember that yeah. all of a sudden the people you had in junior high they weren't there anymore I can remember that way back then but there were a few that you had in classes but then now your classes are all split apart and you rarely saw them it's a scary thing but through that you grow right because then as you went through that fearful thing when 10th grade came around phew, I'm, I'm a pro at this. You don't even think about that. Because you grew through that suffering. And so suffering 
helps you to grow, to depend upon God and so forth. Um, and I think that's what the church needs today. And I think that's what God is bringing to the church yeah. is suffering. It's too easy. You know, it's too easy to, you know, to go to, to well, you don't have to even go to church anymore, right? It's, it's too easy. I don't want to get up. You know what that means? I have to comb my hair. I got to put makeup on. I got to put my, I can actually just stay in my PJs right here and get my phone and view it on, on Facebook Live. How much simple is that? Very simple. And, and I go there and I have to watch everybody and oh, I don't like so-and-so and, oh, and this person rubs me the wrong way and this and that and, you know, and all of a sudden you're like, I'd rather stay here where I don't have to deal with people. So much easier to do that. And we want it easy, but that's not what God wants at all. And it um, reminds me of a, of a story where the father was preaching a message. And it was a big auditorium. And um, he was preaching it. And as he was preaching it, he heard some amens. But he noticed at the very top of this auditorium, his son was throwing beans at people. And so in the message, he says, and I'm going to deal with my son when I'm done here, you know. And, and all of a sudden, he says something like, we must awaken his message. And the son screams out, Dad, keep preaching, keep preaching, and I'll wake up the ones that are sleeping. You know? <laughs> he was throwing beans at the ones that were sleeping, you know, because we want it easy. Like, just, just sleep through the message, you know. And the guy's hitting me in the head with beans because wake up and hear what God is saying. So trials are good, struggles are good, growth pains are good because it helps us to grow and get strong. And I, I get it, there are some that are really overbearing and it takes a long time to, to get through. It takes a lot of prayer, a lot of strength. And so you have to wait upon the Lord and hopefully through prayer, God will be victorious. God bless you, thank you for joining us today. Let me pray and if you have any prayer requests, please post them, and we would love to pray for you. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we, we thank you that you have taken us from something to something, Lord. From an old, ugly, lustful life to a new, peaceful, joyful life. An expectation of a heaven and hope that we have in Jesus, Lord. Thank you so much, Lord. And it's not our work. It's all that Jesus has done. That solid rock, that foundation that was laid by his blood and death upon the cross. And now we can lay ourselves upon that rock, Lord God. Not to be crushed, Lord, but to be saved. Help us, Lord, to walk in the works that you have prepared before us today, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day, and we'll see you on Wednesday.